lads and ladies, welcome to the Junior Classics. Hi there, I'm Sir Bradley Hassey, a teller of borrowed tales. Join me as I share stories of courage, adventure, and wonder. But don't take my word for it. You can find out for yourself on today's Junior Classic. Good day, Junior Scholars. I am Sir Bradley Hassey, guardian of the written word and your guide through the Junior Classics. The Junior Classics are a collection of the greatest stories in history that have been passed down for generations. Our mission is to safeguard the wisdom in these classics before it is lost forever, and to inspire children and families to a love of good reading and a lasting interest in literature, history, and scholarship. If this is your first time joining us, thank you for being here. And a very special thank you to my loyal listeners who tune in each and every week. Today's story is called The Darning Needle by H.C. Anderson. It was written around 1845 and is one of his several stories that include objects that are alive and have their own thoughts, feelings, and intentions. Can you think of any characters in our recent stories that were living objects? So far, we've met the fir tree, the constant tin soldier, and paper ballerina. And today, we have a darning needle and a glass bottle. But first, lost and found words. Starting with, what in the world is a darning needle? A darning needle is a large, thick sewing needle with a blunt end and an eye large enough for a yarn to pass through. Darning is simply a type of sewing for the purpose of repairing clothing or knitting with needle and thread alone. Darning is usually done by hand. Our other words are also related to darning. An embroidery needle is another type of sewing needle that is generally smaller and thinner than a darning needle. For our story, it's helpful to think of a darning needle as thick and tough and an embroidery needle as thin and delicate. Next, we have a train. A train in the sewing and clothing world does not refer to a choo-choo train on the railroad, but the back portion of a dress that trails behind the wearer. Now that we've learned all about sewing, on to the show. I'm going to explain our character in some of the story today before we read it. I think it will be very useful in helping you understand the story. Our main character is a darning needle, and she is a snob. In her mind, she is pretty, important, and fancy, which is why she falsely thinks of herself as a delicate embroidery needle. She is actually selfish, rude, and arrogant. She thinks herself above the tough work that she was created for. And when she breaks, the user of the needle, a cook, fixes her with sealing wax and repurposes her as a breast pin. This makes her feel great for a moment, because she thinks her new neighbor, another pin, may be made of gold. Shortly after, she gets washed down the drain and eventually ends up in the gutter with trash. I think that is enough for you to follow the story. As always, if you have any questions about the story, ask your parents or a teacher. Now, let's meet this snotty darning needle. The Darning Needle by Hans Christian Andersen There was once a darning needle who thought herself so fine she imagined she was an embroidery needle. To the fingers that took her out, she said, Take care and mind you hold me tight. Don't let me fall. If I fall on the ground, I shall certainly never be found again, for I am so fine. That's as it may be, said the fingers, and they grasped her round the body. See, I'm coming with a train. And she drew a long thread after her, but there was no knot in the thread. The fingers pointed the needle just at the cook's slipper, in which the upper leather had burst and was to be sewn together. That's vulgar work. I shall never get through. I'm breaking. I'm breaking. And she really broke. Did I not say so? I'm too fine. 
Now it's quite useless, said the fingers, but they were obliged to hold her fast all the same. For the cook dropped some sealing wax upon the needle and pinned her handkerchief together with it in front. So now I'm a breastpin. I knew very well that I should come to honor. When one is something, one comes to something. And she laughed quietly to herself. And one can never see when a darning needle laughs. There she sat, as proud as if she was in a state coach, and looked all about her. May I be permitted to ask if you are of gold? She inquired of the pin, her neighbor. You have a very pretty appearance and a peculiar head, but it is only little. You must take pains to grow, for it's not everyone that has sealing wax dropped upon him. And the darning needle drew herself up so proudly that she fell out of the handkerchief right into the sink, which the cook was rinsing out. Now we're going on a journey, if I only don't get lost. But she really was lost as she lay in the gutter. I'm too fine for this world, but I know who I am, and there's always something in that. So the darny needle kept her proud behavior and did not lose her good humor. And things of many kinds swam over her, chips and straws and pieces of old newspapers. Only look how they sail. They don't know what is under them. I'm here. I remain firmly here. See, there goes a chip thinking of nothing in the world but of himself, of a chip. There's a straw going by now. How he turns, how he twirls about. Don't think only of yourself. You might easily run up against a stone. There swims a bit of newspaper. What's written upon it has long been forgotten, and yet it gives itself airs. I sit quietly and patiently here. I know who I am, and I shall remain what I am. One day, something lay close beside her that glittered splendidly. Then the darting needle believed that it was a diamond, but it was a bit of broken bottle. And because it shone, the darting needle spoke to it, introducing herself as a breastpin. I suppose you are a diamond? Why, yes, something of that kind. And then each believed the other to be a very valuable thing. And they began speaking about the world and how very conceited it was. I have been in a lady's box, and this lady was a cook. She had five fingers on each hand, and I never saw anything so conceited as those five fingers. And yet they were only there that they might take me out of the box and put me back into it. Were they of good birth? No, indeed, but very haughty. There were five brothers, all of the finger family. And they kept very proudly together, though they were of different lengths. The outermost, the thumbling, was short and fat. He walked out in front of the ranks and only had one joint in his back and could only make a single bow. But he said that if he were hacked off a man, that man was useless for service in war. Dainty Mouth, the second finger, thrust himself into sweet and sour, pointed to the sun and moon, and gave the impression when they wrote. Long Man, the third, looked at all the others over his shoulder. Gold Border, the fourth, went about with a golden belt around his waist, and Little Playman did nothing at all and was proud of it. There was nothing but bragging among them, and therefore I went away. And now we sit here and glitter. At that moment, more water came into the gutter, so that it overflowed, and the bit of bottle was carried away. So he is disposed of. I remain here. I am too fine, but that's my pride, and my pride is honorable. And proudly she sat there and had many great thoughts. I could almost believe I had been born of a sunbeam. I'm so fine. It really appears as if the sunbeams were always seeking for me under the water. Ah, I'm so fine that my mother cannot find me. If I had my old eye, which broke off, I think I should cry. But no, I should not do that. It's not genteel to cry. One day, a couple of street boys lay grubbing in the gutter where they sometimes find old nails, farthings, and similar treasures. It was dirty work, but they took great delight in it. Ow! cried one, who had pricked himself with a darning needle. There's a fellow for you! 
I'm not a fellow. I'm a young lady. But nobody listened to her. The ceiling wax had come off, and she had turned black. But black makes one look slender, and she thought herself finer than even before. Here comes an eggshell sailing along. And they stuck the darning needle fast in the eggshell. White walls and black myself. That looks well. Now one can see me. I only hope I shall not be seasick. But she was not seasick at all. It is good against seasickness. If one has a steel stomach and does not forget that one is a little more than an ordinary person. Now my seasickness is over. The finer one is, the more one can bear. Crack! went the eggshell, for a wagon went over her. Good heavens, how it crushes one! I'm getting seasick now. I'm quite sick. But she was not really sick, though the wagon went over her. She lay there at full length, and there she may lie. The End As usual, H.C. Anderson leaves us with a sudden and unexpected ending. What did you think about the darning needle? Did she seem like someone you would want to be friends with? I think uppity is the best way to describe the darning needle. An uppity person behaves in an unpleasant way because they think they are more important than they really are. Instead of realizing her true nature and embracing the work she was designed for, she tried to be something she was not, and she let everyone know about it. My junior scholars, do not behave like someone you are not, and certainly don't be uppity. Nobody likes that person. There is a very fitting verse from the book of Proverbs. It says, First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Prideful is like being uppity. You think and act like you are way more important than you really are. The darning needle was certainly prideful. She didn't crash, though. She was crushed by a wagon. As you grow up and interact with others, remember to keep your pride and ego in check. It will save you from getting crushed. I am Sir Bradley Hassey. As always, be brave, be loyal, and speak the truth. Now for you parents out there, I want you to understand why we are doing this, what we are trying to achieve, and how you can help us. This is a rescue operation to preserve the classics and the wisdom within before it is lost forever. Our goal is to inspire children with a love of good reading by safeguarding and breathing new life into the greatest stories in history and empower you, the parents, with a resource you can trust to enrich your child's mind and spirit. We don't want these stories and the wisdom within to be forgotten so our children don't have to learn these lessons on their own. The most important thing you can do for us is to spread the message and tell others about these stories and what we are doing. If you want to donate, we would love that as well. My promise is that 100% of donations will go to building the impact and quality of the Junior Classics. If you have feedback and thoughts on how we can do things better, please send an email to thejuniorclassics at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.